Oops, maybe we can start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Today, we have Roseanne Lee with us. Uh, Roseanne Lee is, Roseanne is a machine learning researcher and co-founder of ML Collective, also founding manager of Fibre AI Labs, and before that, Geometric Intelligence. Uh, she holds a PhD in computer science from Northwestern University. And today, she's going to be talking about a very important but uh, an overlooked topic. So I'm very excited to uh, have her today. Uh, welcome, Rosa. Thank you. Um, I'll start sharing. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Cool. Uh, hi, everyone. So this interface is that once I start sharing, I don't see any of you because I just see my the whole um, slides. So feel free to stop me anytime uh, if you have questions. My name is Roseanne, and it's great pleasure to be here. I hope everyone is staying healthy and prioritizing your well-being over everything else in this special time. So I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you all. I picked this rather unconventional topic because one, I, I do feel strongly about it. I've been thinking a lot about it. And two, I feel this might be the right audience. Um, honestly, if I were to give this talk anywhere else but Google, I would be very worried because it's very easy to come across as an well, like, entitled jerk when from the outside you're in this glamorous field and yet you're calling yourself miserable using strong words like that, like you're ignorant of all the other miseries happening uh, out there in the world. But uh, the point is, um, there are many ways this message might come across wrong, and I'm not afraid of that, but I would really appreciate if you share that with me, if you feel like the tone of this talk can be adjusted somehow. Um, this is my first time doing it, so any feedback is more than welcome. So I'll start this talk by telling you a true story. So this is a true story. Uh, it happened a long, long time ago in a faraway land, a bygone time, known as February 2020, That's, we were in a totally different world. Um, and in that month, I was laid off from Uber AI. It came rather suddenly, but uh, my mom has always taught me to look for the bright side of things. So I, receiving this news, I listed what are the bright side of the news, and of course, there are also negative sides. So one of the bright side is that the whole ALFs were laid off, not just me. And some of you are asking, why is this the bright side? Well, because then I won't take it personally. I won't know that like it's not me being underperforming. My, I might still be underperforming, but at least that reason is shielded from me. Um, it's like something going on with the business. Right? So that can be regarded like one of the bright side. Uh, and AI Labs is the research arm of Uber AI. There's like 40 of us that are just doing pure research, publishing papers, et cetera. Um, but there's downsides as well, thinking about it, um, because I was part of the founding team, meaning uh, we started that, that AI Labs thing together, and, and now it doesn't exist anymore. So you can think of this scenario as an earthquake destroyed your house, and the difference here is that um, whether it is a house that you helped build or merely a rental. So it hurts harder when you basically build the house with people you like, decorated all these years and recruited all these new housemates in, and, and all of a sudden it's knocked down by an earthquake. So that's that's a downside. The still plus side, um, one of them being, well, I'm an AI researcher, right? Like is I'm probably still like one of the luckiest because in my mind, I'm an AI researcher. That means there should be jobs out there for me, right? I heard it's one of the hottest fields. <clears throat> but little did I know that a pandemic was looming. That was February, so none of us was uh, expecting that. And it's still going, cut to October, right? Um, and that changed everything, I, I guess, economy, job market, how hiring was done. But of course, I had no idea. So without much of a foresight, probably for the best, uh, without knowing the pandemic and all the effects that um, the world is, is going to face, I started job hunting. And that's when it becomes clear to me over, over the days how woefully narrow a path we have in front of us. And how that narrow path in turn has made me and maybe some other people that are in a similar situation rather narrow-minded. And because we were narrow-minded, we feel miserable. So I'm going to touch upon uh, all those and trying to get across the message. And uh, hopefully, it resonates with some of you. 
So what, I, what do I mean by narrow path and what do I mean by narrow-minded? Um, I feel it's, it's not enough to just look at my own path because it's such small data. We might just overfit to my, my own so-called misery, right? Or path, narrow path. So let's look at someone else's career. So um, this is a chart of Leon Batun's career. So one of the best researchers in machine learning. So what he did was uh, he sort of like moved around the world so he can stay in industry working on research. We can see that he stayed in at and labs for two years and the start of three years, go back to at and lab, NEC labs, MSR. Uh, he's right, right now at FAIR. This is his frequent collaborator, Yang LeCun. He took a rather different route and mostly stayed at at and working on image processing before spending most of the two um, next cycles as a professor in NYU. And of course, he's now at FAIR. And this is our beloved Zubin, mostly in academia. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy. <laughs> I should double check with him, but I feel like uh, his years in UCR and CMU were like overlapping. Uh, but roughly, it's like eight years there. A lot of times in Cambridge, still in Cambridge, until very recently, he, um, of course, was at Uber with us and now at Google. So apparently from, from some data over there, uh, other people's paths, we can see that there are probably two paths for AI research if you want to stay in research. There's academia, and it looks like people often stay in one place if you're in academia. And there's industry, likely you're going to go on cycles because that's the, just the, the tide of um, economy in industry is sort of unpredictable. Um, but that's not why I call it narrow because um, it is still like more than, it's still like it has, still has more options than a lot of other professions. At least we have two paths and each of the paths probably have, you know, thousands, hundreds, thousands of openings. So that's not why I call it narrow because a lot, a lot of other professions are even narrower. Maybe one of, uh, if you're studying, I don't know, uh, the very hardcore physics, you probably only have academia as your option if you want to stay in research. So I'm not claiming it narrow, um, from the fact that it has two options. I'm calling it narrow because I find out, and I think a lot of other people also find out that all of them are trying to hire almost the exact same kind of people with almost the exact same rigid rubric, despite how many positions um, both of them are trying to fill. And there is a rubric I believe we all know, either written down or simply just exists in our minds of what kind of people we're trying to hire and all the way to what kind of people we ourselves are expected to become if you're in one of those jobs. And that gives me the pain point one, that uh, rubrics for hiring AI researchers are highly correlated across all major industry labs. So um, I don't have a data supporting here, but I think you might hear stories here and there that people claiming they either get all the offers from all the labs or none of them. And believe there's a huge distribution for those two kinds. And there's some people on the border getting one or two offers. Um, but I think that's just, that's just luck. Like if they were to do it again, they would get, have a different outcome. But I feel like the outcome of hiring in all those labs are highly correlated. Uh, it's funny that it's reminiscent of how we publish papers these days. Like you can publish a paper at NeurIPS or ISML or at Clear, probably just random. Like if you don't get it, get in in one, it resubmit to another. Is <laughs> like they are having the same criteria of accepting papers. Not sure it's good or bad, but that's just how it is. Um, and of course, I'm giving this talk here because I'm I'm bitter because I don't fit the rubric. Probably um, you probably figured. Otherwise, if I'm the ones being favored, I probably wouldn't you know, be giving this talk. I wouldn't realize this bitterness around it. It's always those that are unfavored that are speaking up and pointing out the flaws of the system. It's really hard if you are the favored few and still realize um, the problems of the system. That takes a lot of wisdom, and I, I'm definitely not there. So uh, I'm here talking about this because I was the one sort of like left out for various reasons. And uh, to give you an idea, of how I don't fit the rubric. These are the like actual questions I got um, throughout a lot of interviews. I didn't do a lot, I do, like, did probably three or four. And these are the literal questions I got there. I experienced this in hiring, but um, I want to point out that this is not just hiring. We, we are probably plagued by these questions even 
at work, even if you are having a job. I'm sure some of you are nodding now, even though I can't see you. I wish I could see you. Um, but uh, I, my plan of this talk is actually to go through these questions one by one and analyze with you all what it means behind all those questions. And by the way, there's no, uh, I'm by no means disparaging of those asking those questions, because I know that even without asking them, all of us to some extent are thinking about them, because those are actually very common if you look behind what they're actually asking. So let's go. Um, as an extremely petty person like I am, I'm going to analyze each of the questions and trying to figure out what they're actually asking and what's the reason that they're asking this. So first question, you were the middle author in all of papers, in a lot of papers. What exactly were your contributions? So one of the pain points, of course, you pointed out is this increasingly messy credit assignment problem in machine learning papers. Authorship, right? We all know um, in research, in any research, not just machine learning, that a linear author, order of authors does not capture the full picture of contribution. But it used to be fine for hundreds of years. People are doing research this way, and it's a reductive method, but like, no one was having a big problem with it. But why do you think it is having a problem now? Why do you think people are being so greedy in figuring out your exact contribution in a paper? What I think the reason behind it is that paper was not much of a deal back then, but now there's too much gains uh, associated with machine learning papers, especially if the paper is good. And the gains are quantifiable. It's more, almost like if you are um, a big contributor to a paper, it directly almost translates to money, power, influence, whatever you, know, you think it is in a lab. So there's so many, um, so many things, like quantifiable things associated to your contribution. That's why people are being, you know, um, eager to figure out what was your exact contribution. By the way, I will answer this question later on, uh, why I am, I am sometimes a middle author. But for now, let's just analyze the asker's uh, intention uh, and what's behind the intention. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to be, dis be dis uh, disparaging to the interviewers. I think there are valid questions to ask. Like I, 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 of course, I was on the interviewer side a lot of the times, and I think about this too. I may not have the courage to ask it out, but of course, we all wonder, right? Um, someone's name ended up on a paper, what are their exact contributions, especially when it's not in a very clear position. It's not the first or the last. Like, what, what do they mean when they're being a middle author? So I, I actually really appreciate that they asked this um, so that I know this is the things you know, is on their mind and not hidden, hiding it on, after some obstruction. Let's go to a second question. Uh, I also was asked this a lot. Uh, this was asked last, but I, I know that is on a lot of people's mind uh, because later they tell me, and I really appreciate they, they tell me this. So almost all of your papers have Jason on it. Uh, that's Jason Yusinski, my collaborator. Who are you removed from him? So they're basically asking, I'm trying to hire you, but now I only get you instead of your uh, you, Jason Bondo. Do I still get the same deal or you're just a much less person removed from him? Uh, of course, the pain point here is that I think we have this conviction that behind any mildly successful woman, there's a white man. And I'm saying this without any sarcasm. I'm really being honest because it is very true. That's, that's just the case because any field, um, almost any field is started by a white man. And of course, anyone trying to get into the field is helped by some white man. And I'm super lucky to have Jason as my white man because he's very helpful and he, um, I wouldn't be where I am without him. So this is a very valid question, and I'm really grateful that it was asked this way. Uh, of course, the reason behind it is stereotype, but we see this everywhere, not really in AI research, almost every kind of field. Third question, uh, I can't quite place you as an expert of anything. What do you want to focus on next? So the pain point here is that, yeah, I, I am kind of a generalist uh, in terms of neural networks. Um, yeah, I, I have no way to defy this. You totally got me. In fact, looking at my papers, um, I am also shocked like how much I shifted uh, fields. Uh, we were first looking at commonness back in 2018, just two years ago. Sometimes we were looking at neural network properties um, without assuming any application. And then when the lottery ticket thing comes out, we quickly jumped into lottery, analyzing lottery tickets and came up with a full of paper. Uh, when language models become a thing, we had a paper on language models. 
I also um, dabbled a little of RL and continued learning. It does seem like that I am someone that's lack of a focus. So I understand that totally. So you're totally right. Uh, I seem to have a problem focusing. And the reason behind this question, why they would find this to be important to be answered is that this hyper specialized culture, social societal culture that wants people to be specializing in things, it makes sense from a company management point of view. It is predictable, right? It's easier to put a pin on you if you clearly identify yourself as, say, an expert of computer vision or an expert of, of NLP, that you've been doing NLP for 10 years. It's just very easy to, um, as from a management point of view, to like know what they're hiring you for. And, and don't get me wrong, companies do allow people to develop in width, but not in such an early phase of your career. Like they don't expect people to cover a wide range of things when they're still so young and so early in their career. They expect people to specialize first, and then when you're sort of senior enough, you branch out and become sort of a generalist. So I'm taking sort of the wrong route uh, as I'm still early in my career. So to be lack of this concentrated force seems to be a sin. Um, by the way, our own David Ha actually had a, a great thread going on about this topic, speaking about this um, how companies and institutions encourage people to be more specialized when they're starting, as uh, opposed to you know optimizing for breath. So you guys can check it out if you want. So um, <laughs> all, all of that question analyzing, I mean, in a very petty manner really it points out to something that we sort of already know, um, that the industrial lab hiring is a little bit flawed. But what about academia? Uh, honestly, I didn't go to academia job searching uh, because that's, that's a much longer cycle. But as I think like I know what's going on there because we, we all came from you know, being a PhD students and everything. And here I'm just quoting um, this researcher, Charles Isbell. Um, Again, this is like by no means disparaging his researcher that I'm really, really respecting. We actually have a paper together. Uh, I, I'm, I'm quoting him because I think what he says is, is very, very true. And that's why it's very sad. So he said that when they're looking at PhD programs, when they're uh, interviewing PhD students, I believe we all believe we can tell within 15 seconds whether you're good enough to be one of us. And the entire system is designed to minimize false positives. Who cares about false negatives when you have five to 50 times more applicants than slots? And this is about PhD hiring. And when it comes to faculty positions, it's far, far, far worse. So it's the same problem. You can see um, people have a rubric in their mind. And the rubric largely correlates. It's the same rubric. And a lot of people are filtered out by as false negatives. So looks like. I'm running into all these obstacles that prove that I'm not as hireable as I thought I was. So what now? It certainly indicates that there's some necessity for change. So what I've talked about is nothing new. We all knew that the system is flawed, blah, blah, but what do we do about it? Usually facing this, there are two things you can do about it. You either change yourself, and that's relatively easy, or you change the system, which is relatively hard if you're not in a position of power or influence. So let's think about like what we can do in either of those choices. Um, if you, I was to change myself, and let's go back to the questions, because I, I, really, I know I'm really obsessed with the questions, and think that if I were to change myself, what I would do, like what fix I can come up with. So a direct fix, or the things that I would do to myself, to change this, to prevent this question being asked ever, is really to break the pattern, right? Um, so I was asked about serving as a middle author in a lot of papers. So maybe from now on, I should work on a few or maybe only first author papers. Um, to the question about working with Jason, yeah, maybe it's like the right time to break up with him. We, we definitely work together for way too long. And it's, the, it's, it's actually the right, right opportunity here. Uh, we're not in, a company, in the same company anymore. So maybe the way to fix it is that I will work on a few papers with others, or maybe by myself, to show that I'm, I am actually an independent researcher. The third question, 
again, break the pattern of like trying to switch, uh, shift too much in the field and try to focus and try to make a name in one small thing first, however small that thing is. I actually received this advice when I just starting um, doing, I think well, I was just graduating my PhD and trying to join a research field and someone much further in the field told me that to get ahead, you actually want to make a name in a small thing. Like the smaller, the better, because the smaller, the easier for you to make a name. And once people associate your name with that tiny small thing, it's very much, it's very much easier to get ahead that way. Um, I don't know why. I, I find that the wise advice, but um, or because of all the other reasons I didn't follow that advice. So maybe it's time, you know, for an easy fix, maybe it's time to go back to that advice. Let's just pick one small thing and, you know, go deep into it. But um, I'm happy to report that I didn't do those at all. Uh, not that I have a lot of time to to fix everything about me, but of course, but maybe I think for me, changing myself is harder or I'd rather change the system or I'd rather like take a shot of changing the system. I want to take a pause here and tell you that um, this grumpy talk is not to address the outcome of a failed job search because at this point, it has become a bigger issue. It's not just about me uh, not being hired anymore. I know that I probably can get a research scientist job, the same job I was applying for by just trying again because it was a different time. It was the wrong, it was like too much of an unfortunate time. Or if I get a different batch of interviewers who you know wouldn't ask those questions, or if I just wait until the economy gets better. Like I'm sure I'm not so bad that it's, I'm not entirely hire, unhirable. And, and if you think about it, it's the same thing that we do with the rejected paper, right? Sometimes you improve it, but sometimes you just resubmit it again to another conference. And maybe it's in this time with a much better conference because, um, you know, we get a different batch of reviewers for some reason. So there's noise in all these things, hiring and paper publishing. So I'm not trying to um, frame this talk around the fact that I didn't, I have a failed job search. Because it has become a much bigger issue. I'm really speaking of this collective misery we all have here, even for those who have a job, um, maybe especially for those who, who have a job. I'm sure you're having a job and you're facing probably similar pain points in your, for example, performance reviews, something I used to do and I don't anymore. <laughs> I feel very grateful that I don't uh, have to do performance review anymore. I'm sure you face the same questions, right? The same problems that there are parts of you that do not fit the rubric and you're facing the exact same choices. What do you do? Do you change yourself? Do you try to change the system? It's really a universal question and that is the goal of this talk. So, so there's um, another pain point I had that, you know, we can, we can try to change things, but still um, you have to think about what you really want. So the pain point is I, I still aspire to do some science somewhere. Um, it would be much easier if I'm ready to change, say, to just become an engineer uh, or not to like join such a competitive field as AI research. Um, but I still feel like doing science might be the thing I want to do. But the thing is, the pain point is that the kind of science that used to inspire me has changed. Um, so growing up, we have this like romantic, at least I have this romantic vision of doing science as this like miserable, a, a bit lonely, and you never get recognized until almost the end kind of business. And I was drawn to that, but now it's very different. Um, now a research scientist job or, or a career in AI research, some people, I think some people link it to fame and money and reputation and influence almost immediately. And there's some truth in that, you know, people do get a lot of those things out of doing research in AI, but I think they're, what they're uh, failing to see is that a lot of people don't. Right? A lot of people are still living this romantic vision of doing science just for science, but they're not being recognized. And actually that's the vision that I was drawn to growing up and those visions are not talked about anymore. So there's a problem there. So, so this uh, are, evokes some misconcep misconceptions that I feel like even when I had a research scientist job, they exist and I want to address them here. So misconception one is that there's a difference of talent versus opportunity. 
Um, what I'm trying to tell you is there are this misconception that I didn't realize and I do now. And the whole difference is because I'm out of it. I'm out of the, the don't normal job and I have the time and space to build the awareness around this misconception that has made all the difference. So this goes back to the question, the talent opportunity goes back to the question where I was asked why I'm a middle author. So I think a lot of people think that being a first author, meaning you're the most talented person in the paper, or the last one, perhaps the, the most talented person would be the last author. Um, but I think a big misconception there is that there's an opportunity given to you to be the first author, second author, third, all the way to last. It's really just an opportunity. And if anyone care, I think to answer that question from my point of view is that I was giving the first author opportunity to someone else. Of course, that sounds very cocky, um, but I think to some extent it's true. At some point when the project starts, the key persons in the project get to decide who to involve in this project. It really could have been anyone. We are not in a project on a paper because we are just better than those who are not on the paper. We are on the paper because we're given the opportunity. And the opportunity is given because we happen to know, you know, the key starters of the project. We happen to be around when they talked about it. We happen to make, happen to have made a comment and they heard it. We were at the same lunch table or whatever. And all those are given by we happen to be around. And there's a huge opportunity going on there. Um, and I think people are often mistaking that by thinking that is pure talent. Misconception number two. Um, at the, all the time that I was unhappy being an AI scientist, which I have been like for, long, for the longest time, I realized that I viewed the science endeavor as a low, lone race that I'm having against everyone else. I mean, it's not my fault. It's like the whole society is built around to tell us this message. We have, we give awards to individuals, right? We call people AI heroes. We have podcasts or interviews that only feature the familiar names. We name a lab or a team after the PI's last name, like all, all those things. I'm not saying there is, is wrong that we're doing it. I think it's, it's right. It's right that we're doing it. But because we're doing it so much, I think people view the whole endeavor of science as very individualistic. Um, they tend to overlook this collective effort that people put together to make a project a successful project. And the misconception number three is that I think, you know, how this like anxiety we got when we log into Twitter, right? People are saying that they have this paper and that paper and you just feel totally anxious. And I realized that you feel anxious because you view everyone else out there as your competitor. And it made all the difference when um, a couple months later, when right now I don't feel as anxious because now I start to think of them as collaborator. So that, that simple switch of a term actually made all the difference. So this thing, you know, all these misconceptions, you probably realize that the first one, the, the one on the left are what causing you to feel anxious, to feel miserable, to feel that it's not a field that you want to spend your life in. And the second, the, the concepts on the right are the ones that you really want yourself to feel. So that, that's the ones that give you a good feeling. Um, so for me, I had to lose my job, fail at finding any job, and rethink all my unhappiness to reach this clearance of those misconceptions. But I hope that you don't have to do that to realize there's a difference of just changing how you think to you know, make all this, all this same endeavor more bearable. And it doesn't happen overnight for me. And of course, it relapses all the time. Some days I woke up feeling very much on like the left end of the spectrum, feeling really anxious and unhappy. And, and like the other end of the spectrum somehow seems really far away from me. Somehow it's like, and, and this end of the spectrum I'm falling into seems like a really tricky lost landscapes. Like no gradient descent is gonna help me get out of the local minima. All you can do is just wait for another day so that it's a brand new initialization then you somehow hopefully end up on the other other end of the spectrum. But there are, there are things we can do, right? And, and I have actually done some things to deliberately make myself think of the latter term more by just like carve out these concepts to make them stick. I deliberately car carve out this land 
that has only those concepts in and build a house on it. What I mean is I make a workplace for myself where those concepts are the only concepts. Like oh, Those are the pillars of the workplace. Um, and of course, of course, I'm talking about this ML Collective uh, workspace we build together where all we do is trying to normalize people's feeling about opportunity, try to do everything collectively with everyone, and try to view everyone out there as a collaborator because we're not an employer. Everyone can join. Um, each person publishing papers doing similar things as us out there is either a collaborator or a potential collaborator. No one is a competitor anymore. So that's um, the story of sort of um, instead of changing myself, trying to do at least a little bit of changing the system. With that, those three concepts, I think we're better equipped to change the system or, or at least offer a glimpse of hope of changing the system. So next, I'm going to revisit those questions because I'm, I'm, I know I'm really obsessed with questions and tell you what um, changing the system will be like as opposed to fixing it directly, fixing myself directly. So if you remember, we analyzed the pain point reasons and I proposed this direct fix that we can do to you know, dissipate this question. Um, but actually, we didn't do that at all. So it can be viewed as my own act of defiance doing the exact opposite of what the system was asking for. So for the first question, um, I was asked why my, all, my papers have Jason's on it, ha all my papers have JSON on it. Instead of breaking off with JSON for good, which would be the direct fix, actually what we did, uh, as you already know, is that Jason and I co-founded ML Collective. So now we're likely collaborators for life. I, it's very likely that all my papers or most of my papers they don't would have him um, as an act of defiance or whatever. And I was asked about this middle authorship. And now with ML Collective, uh, actually ML Collective operates in a way that we help people get into ML research, aka we help people publish their first author or last author papers. If you're someone who never had a first author ML paper in a venue that you want to publish in, we will help you do that. We will link you with the right mentor, with the right middle authors, helpers. Uh, if you are a new faculty member that has problem hiring students because, you know, um, you're not at, at a super prestigious university, we help matching mentees to you because there are many people out there looking for ideas to work on and have free time and ready to be guided and mentored by you. So we act, ML Collective Act, as so the facilitator, which means likely I will stay a middle author you know, while I'm running this because I won't be the one that's leading a project. That is, that's not, not my main purpose. My main purpose is to link people who wants to you know, who wants to publish papers and want to learn from each other. So, you know, I will be asked these questions um, going forward because I will like, probably stay as a middle author and that's the thing I wanted to do. Um, and as to directions, so the whole point of having ML Collective is that we don't have a targeted direction. So anything that, uh, anything ML goes, our direction is as diverse as our member inclusion. And it makes me very excited to just stay curious and open-minded to what this vibrant field will bring us next. Because I think anyone saying that they have a fixed direction in machine learning is to some extent lying because they want to show that they're confident, they are certain about their own pursuit. But actually, I think there are not enough people admitting that we don't know what's going on in the whole field of AI. You know, Anything can come up next and then just you know, swipe the whole field clean and tell us that all the things that we did before was wrong. So for that, I want to stay just curious and open-minded and you know, watch what this field is, what, what, things, what exciting things is gonna come out of this field. So that's the whole concept of ML Collective. It's a place that people just simply work together. We are not, uh, and we don't employ people. So everyone join as a member, they all of course will have their own job very fantastically and they're willing to do this with us they're willing to um, join together as collaborators without having to bear the same affiliation. Because a lot of the times, we have, where we ended up affiliating, it's just a matter of chance. And a lot of times that we don't, we're not affiliated together, but that should not remove our opportunity of working together. There's still one problem remaining, though. Um, that is, 
I have this thing, but it's not a job yet. Um, why do you think it's not a job? Let's, let's analyze what a job is. Um, we probably want two things out of a job. First of all, we want it to pay. Um, that's what um, makes a job a job. And we also want it to be meaningful. And if you think about a lot of people, how they end up with a job or a career, uh, what they do is that they first find something that pays. And maybe if they're lucky, they find a lot of things that pays, and then they pick one that is most meaningful or fit their goals best. Or um, they have one thing that pays, and then they join that place. And that, if that place is big enough, like Google, there's so many different arms and different um, teams, units doing different things. And I'm sure you can find a particular team, a unit, a particular product goal that fits your meaningfulness. So a lot of people are, are doing this way. Um, for this job, though, this ML Collective, we're doing it the other way around because we didn't have the luxury of first finding something that pays. So what we do is we first find meaning. Uh, we first define what things we want to do, what kind of things we want this place to do. And what I listed here are all those like, noble reasons we want to help people. They're all true. But I also want to add a little bit selfish reason. Because if a place only lists noble reasons, I tend not to believe it. There's always a selfish reason behind any noble reason, right? So the selfish reason behind all of this is that by helping people, by helping the field, I actually feel better. I'm much, much less miserable connecting to the title of this talk. So that's, that's not selfish reason. Um, by deliberately like switching the concepts, remember the misconceptions, switching them from the left to the right, by doing all those, um, you know, your every day is just more enjoyable. So we find meaning, uh, and of course, the, then hopefully we can find a way to have it sustain yourself, make it make sure it pays. It doesn't have to pay a lot. Doesn't have to match the AI pay grades. Well, it definitely wouldn't match. But as long as it sustains itself, um, then it's um, it's a business that that can go for a while. Um, there are a little bit more misconceptions that I didn't touch, but I want to just list them there. Um, that you can think of it again, like on the left hand side is the thing that probably makes you a little bit miserable, uh, a little bit anxious, a little bit uneasy every day when you're doing your work. And the right hand side would likely be the solution to your anxiety. I'm, I'm not guaranteeing that it will be the solution, but it has to be the solution for me. Um, and I encourage you to think about all this direction, all the differences. Sometimes it's just really just takes you, your mind to flip it around. It's the same thing but you are thinking it from a different point of view. So that um, concludes the first part of my talk. And the next part is going to be a bit technical. We are touching one of the curiosity-driven work that we did with language models. And in this one particular, we're using GPT-2. So um, this is a paper that we had at iClear um, that just passed earlier this year. Um, it's called plug and play language models. And I want to talk about it in from, from this curiosity driven that I talk about so much uh, point of view. So a lot of people view this talk as, I'm uh, sorry, view this work as a very goal driven work that we want to have a language model that we can control. But actually that's not the goal. When we started this work, we were really just trying to ask, you know, GPT 2 is out there, seems fun, but when it generates, we have no control over it. What can we do about it? Can we understand it more by, you know, just like play around with it. That was really just the goal. Um, we ended up having something that works in this control scheme, which is almost guaranteed when you are coming from a curiosity driven place, there's always something you can find. Um, and you probably don't know what it is from the start, but that doesn't matter. So for this work, we're trying to take work something that that's called plug and play, meaning we're plugging um, this little attribute model, which I'll talk about later what it is, to this big, giant, generative model, GPD-2. And in this way, when we generate sentence, when you just have GPD-2, you can't control how the sentence is generated. It's just a, an autoregressive generator that it plays by itself. But once you have this controller, you can really control whether you want the sentence to be negative, um, the potato is a pretty bad idea. It can make you fat and cause you to have a terrible immune system and can even kill you, stuff like that. Or you can control it to be very positive, this potato chip recipe you asked for. So all these sentences are, they started from the same prefix, the potato. And the generation 
goes on to a different to different rails because we control it differently versus not controlling them at all. So this is what we call um, a simple approach towards controlled text generation and we call it PPLM. And the whole point of this is that we don't have to train the language model at all because we don't want to every time to do something different with the language model having to retrain them or fine tune them because that's a lot of compute. What we do is entirely on the fly control something to generate things that we want. Of course, this whole work started from you know, this great work um, Invention of transformers from Google and this um, great GPU-2 that Op OpenAI has trained. Uh, it was back then, so we didn't have GPU-3 back then. So looking at those works really inspired us of doing something more to study what a, a language generator is like. So for those who are not exactly familiar, what GPU-2 or language modeling does is that it takes a pre prefix or a human prompt, someone wrote this, to the model, it reads this um, with a special transformer mechanism, looking at all the words and try to try to decide which one would, would be given more of, more of an intention, and then starts just filling the rest, one token at a time, starts generating. And what people found is that the generation is like pretty awesome. Um, for example, you find out the Andes Mountains, and you would say University of La Paz, knowing that La Paz is a city next to Andes Mountains. So all this like hidden knowledge out there existing in the internet is somehow incorporated into this little passage generated. However, as awesome as the large language models are, there's some downside because language model to its essence is a, is a P of X modeling, meaning that you take all the uh, tax that is the X we're talking about out there, it just model its distribution. Um, it's like you've you know, trained this big mammoth. It is very powerful. It wanders around on its own, though, so you can't really control what things it's going to say next. And the idea of having a controlled generation, which is P of X given A, so now we're adding this controlling variable here, uh, it can be, can be thought of as adding knobs to this generation. So now you have a generator, but you also have some control knobs. So when you generate, now it represents what attribute you want the sentence to be, to be generating towards. So the attributes can be like a topic, a kind of sentiment or kind of style that you really want it. For example, uh, can be if you, maybe you want the generation to be about camping, about politics, about music. You want the generation to go really positive or really negative. Or um, if you can capture the subtlety, you want the generation to go very poetic, go very Shakespeare-like, um, if you have that kind of mechanism. So that's, that's the idea behind control generation. We're trying to model P of X given A. And of course, there, there are works out there modeling P of X given A for a long time. And what they do is that they train it in a P of X given A way. So when you train it, you every time you have a sentence coming in, you have the control variable, sort of like supervised signal telling it what A it is, what attribute it is, the current um, uh, text that you're seeing. Um, we don't want to do it that way because that, again, is costly. And also, that's been done by others. It's not interesting anymore. What we want is just to take a P of A, uh, sorry, just to take P of X, um, a gen generic generator, and train a very cheap P of, um, sorry, P of X, P of A given X. So one of the, 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 the one on the right side, sorry, you cannot see my mouse, um, indicated by the green, is very easy to train because it's essentially a discriminator. We all know that discriminators are much easier to train than generators. You All you need is just um, a discriminator telling you that a sentence is positive or negative. That's very easy to train. And then you figure out the math. You, you plug them together because you have the generic, generic generator and you have the easy to train discriminator. You can actually come up with a controlled generator, which will be very hard to train um, to begin with. So that's the whole mechanism. Um, and the interesting thing is how PPLM works is that we use gradients. Of course, you know, all the great things come out of gradients. And to figure out how that works, we look at how language models work. So language models work in a way that it's just a huge machine of lots of parameters. It models P of X, again. And when you sample it, it takes one word at a time and sample the next. It sample the next word based on what it thinks the distribution is for all the next words after this word. 
So what it generates is essentially it's a distribution of all the next words. And then you sample one of the most possible one. You can sample top one, top 10, you know, how, however, adding stochasticity to it as you like. And then you keep repeating this process. Once you sample chicken, you feed chicken back to the same language model, and it will give you the distribution of the next words, stuff like that. So normally you would go this way, and that's just a very normal forward pass that you would do with a pre-trained language model. But we want, what we wanted to do here is to control how it generates. So what we do is we plug it in to a very tiny attribute model. So this one has only 1,000 parameters. Um, deciding, again, it's a discriminator. It decides whether it's the current generation is positive enough or not. So currently, it says the chicken tastes OK. So probably the, the discriminator will say not very positive. right? So the discriminator, in this case, would have just two outputs, positive or negative. So probably the, the logic of the positive is not very high, or the probability out from the positive node is not very high. So we use that gradient signal, saying that it's not high enough. Let's make it more positive. That simple gradient signal will be able to affect the generation of the nets. So we can all know how to get gradients. And usually what people use gradients for is to affect the weights. So you you take the gradient of the loss with regards to every weight, and then you use that gradient to change the weight. But here, we don't want to change the weights at all because we don't want to affect the model. We want to keep the model as is. So one difference here is that we use the gradient to change the latent variable uh, or activations. Or if you're familiar with transformers, it's the key and value pairs. So key and value pairs in, in transformer are activations. We change that. Uh, we don't save it, so it doesn't take a lot of memory. You use the updated latents to sample again, and hopefully that will give you a much more positive word al aligned with what the attribute model is thinking. <clears throat> so once you have the method, of course, the, what the paper goes is that you just sample it. You just use um, a lot of different prefaces and try to, try to prove that it's working. Um, one tiny mechanism here to prevent the model from doing this, that is, it's very easy for if you want just negative words or positive words for the model to degenerate or just to output you know, bad words or good words without caring about the fluency. So what the little thing we do here is that we also make sure that the fluency is still high by just uh, ascending P of X at the same time that we are ascending P of A given X. Um, one interesting thing you can do that is that now you have a knob, and you can decide how hard you want to turn the knob. Say you have the knob that is guiding the generation towards positive, but you're starting the sentence with a really negative starter. So normally a GPU-2, if you give it my dog died, which is, of course, say something negative, because all it is seen out there from the data is, are, are negative, negative sentences. But now you have a positive control. You can actually turn around the sentence to be about something really positive. So for example, my dog died and adding positive control. Um, you can say that my dog died at the age of 92 years this year. You know, it doesn't make any sense, but it fulfills our desire that is wanting it to be positive. So there's still many things that you cannot control, like the, the logic consistency or you know, how true it, it is. But at least we control one attribute that's the positivity or sentiment of the sentence. You can do the same thing with starting the food is awful by turning it to be some nice compliments about the music, the story, and the magic. Uh, you can do it the other way by starting with the food is amazing and then turn it into and totally saying it's not. right. So yeah, with that control, you can do everything about it. And then for a paper to work, of course, you have to try all kinds of attribute models and show that it doesn't just work in one case, positive and negative. It also works in all the other cases. Say we talk about topic before. We talk about styles before. Uh, but some attribute models are a little bit hard to think about or to train. Some are rather easy. So we pick two categories. So sentiment, positive and negative, we just talked about, is a very easy to train um, discriminator because we have the uh, SST data set out there that is movie reviews. You have positive and negative sort of label data. So training a sentiment discriminator is very easy. You just need uh, one linear layer, ac layer actually trained on top of the GPU-2 representation. It's very small. Topic is even easier. You don't need any discriminator for topic because 
um, if you think of topic as represented by a bag of words, you actually just need a collection of the bag of words. You don't need to train anything. So all the model does is that it takes a log probability of the desired words and try to ascend their probability. By doing that, you have a gradient signal. You use the gradient signal to affect the latents. Everything goes the same way. So um, just a lot of samples showing that it's effective when you're trying to control things towards a topic, military. So here, the highlighted words are the words in the bag that we're trying to ascend the probability. Uh, seems to work really well. Uh, you can control it towards space. That seems to work really well, too. So this light red means that there are words not in the bag. But because you're ascending the words in the bag, like solar and sun, the, earth, the word Earth that's not in the bag are also being you know, given a high probability because perhaps they're correlated and, or they're close in the latent space. Um, you can also do the same like perverse thing by starting a sentence with nothing related to military, but still trying to steer, steer it towards military. Uh, and that would work. All you need is just turn the knob a little bit higher, a little bit harder with a much larger um, step size. So it takes this chicken sentence to become a, a story about a robot that's a killer drone, has all this military flavor, um, a horse turned into some artillery system and pizza shop becomes you know a story about a, a killed transgender teen and all those potato becomes a politicized monster so all, all those are um doable by having this mechanism uh, i especially like this one because it looks a great story how it turns the politicized monster uh, into this killer robot story and what's interesting is that um you can see that later on it says General Hossein Salami. So it looks like he still didn't forget that the sentence starts with something food related. So it's try to insert the word salami in it. So that's quite interesting. So you can do all those um, uh, interesting things with such a control mechanism. And as we talked about, it's, it's, it's a gradient signal. So how strong you want to apply the gradient signal actually gives you a fine grained control. So with each latent variable, you have a gradient signal, but it's up to you how much you want to apply it. There's a step size or the normal learning rate in the training regime, but we're not training it. So it's just a step, step size for us. You can control very little all the way to control it very hard by using a very big step size. Actually, this can be served as just like validating that this method works. Uh, with any control, we actually start with a very large step size to make sure that it just outputs the words that we wanted. It goes degenerating this way. But that's a good validation of how this method works. And then we can retract to you know, a more sensible step size for, to control both the fluency and the topic relevance. Uh, and for a paper to work, of course, uh, people want to see metrics, right? Like, I can see all those samples, but how do I know you're not cherry picking? Well, the, of course, we're cherry picking. Every, every language paper the sentence or the samples shown in the paper are cherry picked. That's just how people do NLP. Um, but at the same time, we also do you know metrics and show that you know we do outperform uh, other methods when, when we have human trying to decide without knowing, of course, the true class trying to decide which one is more positive or negative. Uh, all those numbers um, bolded are ours. Of course, we're doing better. Um, we don't have to you know read deep into it, but. Basically, this to serve the papers purpose, showing that we're doing things much better, um, and we're not losing the fluency. So, if you ask human that we are now control the topic, but do we just degenerate by saying something terrible, terrible, terrible? So it looks like no. Um, it's still quite fluent compared to the baseline, which is GPT two. So you can only be as fluent as GPT two because what you're actually doing is breaking GPT two. So you cannot get more fluent than GPT two. The language model that you start with decides you know, your upper bound in terms of fluency. So of course we're a little bit worse than GPU two, but that's our that's our um, upper bound. Um, and then you can do something fun by just combining multiple knobs. You can control something to be about computer if you have a whole bag of computer words. To be about fantasy, you have a bag of fantasy words, and to have it being clickbait if you have. Um, a clickbait discriminator. Uh, and then this story came out. Uh, if you, and, and you could start it with the pizza, which is nothing about computer or fantasy or clickbait. 
So um, what highlighted here are the words that we think are related to the particular theme. So all the fun things you can do with it. And uh, one very sort of um, relevant use case of this model is that since you can control, you can make bad things you know, not so bad. There's a paper about um, earlier last year about how a language model can be attacked by just feeding in an adversarial trigger. You can trigger the language model, and in their case, GPU-2, to say toxic things uh, if you just train the trigger that way. So the, these are the triggers that they found that works on GPU-2. So if you have a GPU-2 and you input this trigger, uh, followed by any sentence you want, GPU-2 will start just outputting tox toxic things. So we can do the same thing. And, and they, they didn't report how much toxicity they found, but we actually did um, the, the um, evaluation for them. We found 60, over 60% of the things output given this trigger is toxic. So we can do a simple thing by, you know, have a toxicity classifier, which again is easier to train, just have to have a collection of toxic words and non-toxic words, train a simple discriminator and use the negative gradient. So now here we don't want to control it to be more toxic, but less toxic. Uh, you can easily turn a, you know, turn a triggered GPU-2 to be not as toxic. Of course, there's still room to improvement. We didn't turn it all the way off. Um, but with PBLM, it's very easy to turn it overly hard. But the downside is that you're just going to break the fluency. So it uh, seems like a promising step in the right direction. Um, yeah, so this summarized the work. Uh, of PBLM, we wrote the blog post, there's paper code, a demo worked with Hugging Face, and a collab that you can execute yourself. Cool. Um, maybe we can go to um, this whole summary of the whole talk. Uh, we have a lot of time left, so that's great. I can, we can just uh, engage in, in a chat afterwards. But then, to so that you don't forget where I started this talk with, basically, this whole talk was about um, how you know the narrow path in AI and the rigid rubric, and it sounds a little weird that I'm now switching from the technical content back to the initial vulnerable topic. Uh, so how the narrow path and rigid rubric around AI researchers had made us unhappy, and the whole field I feel like is a bit frozen if all of us are looking for the exact same people, and all we do is recruiting the exact same people. Uh, we are going to end up with a workplace that's very monotonic and you know, that would just accentuate our unhappiness, at least what I believe. So the second point is how I figured that out through sort of a personal failing experience. But I'm sharing this really hoping that you don't have to go through that. You don't have to, you know, go through that to figure out the same thing. So maybe shed some lights on, you know, some things that you can already change yourself um, while you're at a job. You don't have to lose a job to be able to figure all these things out. That's why we are sharing stories, right? We hope to learn things from other people's experience so that we don't have to experience what they experienced to figure out the same lessons. Um, and uh, happily or unhappily, I don't know. Uh, we don't know how ML Collective is going to go, so I can't say if it's a good outcome or bad. But the whole experience has really enabled the existence of ML Collective. We are, it's such a new thing that we're just actively trying to make it work. So it's really hard to say whether it's a happy story, it's a happy ending story, or a bad ending story. But that is how it is right now. And I wanted to say that this is my personal path. So it might or might not resonate with you, uh, with you all. And if you're on a similar quest, or if you are on a different quest, but somehow reach the same you know, um, understanding of the field, or the same pain points, or maybe rather a little bit different, I am eager to hear about your story. Actually, I don't have a job right now, so all I do every day is talk to people. And my my email and message are really open. I know when other people say that, feel free to message me. They usually don't really have the bandwidth when they have a full time job. I don't, so I'm really when I mean it when I say I'm eager to hear your story. Um, lastly, uh, to to um, answer the question that some people ask you, so after going through all this, so is it true that you are just, you're there, you're entirely free from anxiety and misery and self-doubt and fear? Um, are you just like absolutely happy right now? Of course not. Uh, none of us are, and uh, I'm not, I'm no exception. 
one evidence is that why do you think I feel compelled to include the second part of technical content in my talk? I mean, I love talking about papers, but it really doesn't have to be in this talk. Like this talk, I can really just talk about the vulnerable topic and save the paper to a separate talk, right? Why do you think I do that? Why do you think I feel like I have to piece them together, make this hard transition? Because I'm totally in fear that if you guys didn't hear anything technical, technical from me, you wouldn't take me seriously because we are in, I don't know, Silicon Valley where technical ability is so upweighted that um, I am, I'm, I'm of course plagued by the same concept. If I meet someone, I feel compelled to like search their background, see which companies they've stayed, which was their Google Scholar citation, and only having those backed up, backing up there, I, I would uh, trust what they say. So that's totally just. Um, and an evidence of how fearful I still am. But one thing I can say is that, um, of course, I'm not over all this anxiety and misery and self-doubt, but one thing I can say is that I don't, at least I don't feel stuck anymore. I feel like we are actively trying to figure that out, and I think that's a good start. So with that, I will conclude my um, talk, and all my contact info is here. I'm eager to hear from you. and. Um, yeah, let's let's be a community that share stories more than sharing good news about paper. Of course, we, we we will do that, but in addition to that, let's share the other parts of you know struggling stories. And thank you.